This is the UV Viz. Its full name is UV-Viz-NIR. That stands for ultraviolet dash visible dash near infrared light. This when, depending on the detector that you are using, uh, this has the capability to go all the way from approximately 150 or 200 nanometers all the way up to 3300 nanometers. So way up into the near infrared region. Um, like I mentioned, that depends on the detector. There are three different detectors that go here. We, um, that we own, there are significantly more than that out in the world. Um, but we own a 2D detector, an integrating sphere, and a universal reflectance accessory. And I'm gonna go into all three of those. Um, what you're looking at here is sort of the base of the instrument without any detectors installed. The light source is behind that green mesh in the top left corner. Um, the light source, we have both a tungsten lamp and a deuterium lamp, which cover the full range of wavelengths. Uh, the light from those lamps is then filtered through a monochromator, which is located about in the center of the instrument. Uh, the monochromator is basically a prism that separates out the wavelengths of light that we get from those two lamps so that we get one wavelength at a time coming through the instrument. So that monochromator will filter one wavelength of light through to the left side here. There is a beam splitter, so we end up with two beams here, and the two beams pass through the middle portion and then into the detector. Now, if we're using the 2D detector, that is the simplest of our detectors. It also has the widest range available to it. Um, the 2D detector is mostly used for liquids, but it's just got two beams that come through and then a big uh, detector that sits here. Um, and I'll actually show you that. Uh, the other two detectors, the integrating sphere and the universal reflectance accessory, actually have additional optics and electronics within the detector to direct the light in different ways, where the 2D detector really just passively picks up the light that comes directly through. Um, we have one main sample compartment and then the, like I mentioned, the integrating sphere and the universal reflectance accessory, because they have different optics, they have a secondary location where you can put your samples. This main sample holder section right here has spots for two cuvettes, one in the front, one in the back. This front spot is the sample location, the back is the reference location. So if you are working with a solution, you would put your base material here and then your solution in the front. Um, if you don't have a solution or you want to take information on the entirety of what's inside your cuvette, the back would just be an empty cuvette and the front would be not an empty cuvette. These are the drawers directly beneath the computer. So if you're facing the UV vis and you turn to the right, these are the drawers that are underneath the desk space there. Um, most of these drawers are accessible to you. Really the only drawer that you won't need to use is uh, kind of middle right side here that says retired UV Viz consumables. Um, all of the rest of those though are available to you as the client. This top drawer has cuvettes in it. We have two different kinds of cuvettes for analysis. We have UV cuvettes and we have regular cuvettes. So UV cuvettes are going to go down into the 150 to 200 nanometer kind of region. They will get noisier as you get closer, or as you get lower, but these will work better for the UV range. These other cuvettes are going to be better through visible and up into near infrared region. So make sure you choose the right cuvettes. These cuvettes are to be used with the 2D detector. This next drawer over has a bunch of random accessories, and actually some of the stuff is up on the counter currently. These are things that you can use inside of the UV Viz, um, especially in the integrating sphere. Um, the integrating sphere is good for solid samples, and if your solid sample is very, very small, you'll put on a slit um, or some sort of mask to keep from, uh, to keep the light specifically to your sample. So these are accessories that you can use to kind of uh, rig up some sort of holder that works well for whatever size of solid sample you may have. 
the rest of the drawers, other than the right middle, are the various detectors that we own. So we have the integrating sphere located here on the left middle, the 2D detector on the bottom left, and the universal reflectance accessory on the bottom right. I'm going to open up the detectors, the drawers for the 2D detector and the universal reflectance accessory, which to keep from saying that over and over, I'm going to call the URA from now on. So I'm going to open up the 2D and the URA so that you can show them. For the remaining part of this video, because these two are fairly simple uh, as far as how to load your samples into them, I'm going to work with the integrating sphere just to show you how it works. It's a little bit more complex, but they are more... Um, the integrating sphere will have all of the same principles of operating the machine as the 2D detector or the URA would have. So this is the 2D detector and you can tell because of the little green plaque up in the top right it says 2D detector. As you can see there are there's really nothing to this. It's a big blank box. This inserts into the UV vis and like I mentioned earlier, really just passively collects the light that comes through. This is ideal for samples that are in the cuvettes because they mount nicely into the sample holder. However, you can do solids if you're able to figure out a way to suspend that solid in the light path. Um, the 2D detector has the widest range available of wavelengths, so it will go all the way down to the lower UV and all the way up to the upper near infrared without introducing too much extra noise. We keep these detectors covered with plastic in the drawers to keep excess dust from falling on the optics. Next we'll look at the URA. Next we'll look at the URA. This is the universal reflectance accessory. As you can see, it's a little bit different from the 2D detector. The difference is, instead of placing your sample in the cuvettes, in the sample holder on the machine itself, you actually place your sample here, and I'll move the plastic out of the way. You place your sample here over this hole. The light will come up from below, bounce off of your sample in reflectance mode, as the name of the accessory would indicate, and then it bounces back off into a detector. What's cool about the URA is that you can do glancing angle between 8 degrees and 60 or so degrees on your sample. So you can see the difference between incidence and direct light and all of the angles kind of in between, in addition to looking at the various wavelengths that are affected at those various um, angles. There is one other little lid on the side there. That lid goes over your sample to make sure that no light from the room enters while you are collecting data. The URA in the software does have a couple of extra options and I will show you those. Um, but as far as sample loading and sample prep, it's fairly easy. It is mainly to be used for solids, but you could use uh, a liquid or a powder as long as you prepped it properly. So now this is the UV Viz with the integrating sphere attached. Again, with the green plaque on the top right corner, you can see that this is the integrating sphere. Um, typically, we will have either the 2D detector or the integrating sphere installed into the machine. So when you come to the machine, typically this is what it's going to look like. It is not your job to switch out the attachments. That is the job of staff. Please communicate with staff before your scheduled time so that they know which attachment you would like to use so that they are sure, so that they can switch out to the URA or the 2D detector or the integrating sphere as you need. Um, these detectors, if they are swapped out incorrectly, can very easily break. Um, we can get surges of power that are not supposed to happen or bent pins. They're very expensive and they take a long time to repair. So um, that is the responsibility of the staff. Please do not change these out. If you need them changed out, uh, contact us and we will happily do so for you. So this is the integrating sphere as it's been attached right here. Opening up the lid, you can see there's quite a bit more as far as optics in here. The purpose of an integrating sphere is to collect all of the um, 
diffused, diffracted, um, and direct light that goes through or bounces off of your sample. So in this case, you can see we've got these two mirrors here. The two beams that come through bounce off of those two mirrors, bounce off of two more mirrors that are in the back here. One beam of light comes in through this hole, the other comes around to the back and comes in through the side of the sphere. This back beam, you might remember, is a reference beam. So the one that bounces back and through the back and into here, we use that to determine what 100% of the light looks like, so that we know how strong of light we should expect as normal. The other beam comes through here and it passes through your sample, if your sample is sitting here. And then there is a sphere in here. The sphere is made out of spectralon, which is a very reflective material. And that funnels all of your light down into a detector down at the bottom. Spectralon, unfortunately, does absorb quite a bit of light. Um, so you can't go all the way up to the near infrared and you can't go all the way down into the lower UV regions with this. So if you start seeing noise on the outer edges of our um, capabilities here, know that that's because of the spectralon in here. That's because of the limitations of this particular attachment. So this, if you put your sample here, we've got light and then your sample and then your detector inside of here. And that is transmitted, transmitted light. Any light that goes through your sample to the detector, that's going to be transmitted. And that's the information you're going to get. What's cool about the integrating sphere is we can also get reflected light by removing this little back piece right here. This just has a little magnet that is attached, attaching it to the side here. And you can see if I pull out on this, there's another little hole in the back of the instrument there. So if you put your sample here, and what you do is remove this little white spectralon piece, you'd attach your sample to this hole here, and then use this spring-loaded piece to hold your sample in place. Again, um, slits can be used to, to make that hole smaller, because you can see that's quite a bit larger than some people's samples would be. But you'd put that on, put this um, piece back onto the uh, side so that no light comes in, and then, back and then you have light detector sample. So what happens is the light comes in, bounces off of your sample, and then bounces around in the sphere and down into the detector. So this is going to be your reflected light, is what you would see if you place your sample on this side. So transmitted, reflected, between the two of those you can get the approximate absorbance of a solid sample. About one hour before your scheduled time, the UV vis needs to be switched on in order to start warming up. For that reason, at the beginning of the day, the earliest you could schedule to use the UV vis is 10 o'clock, since our staff come in at 9 o'clock and they could turn, in, turn on the UV vis at that time for you. Um, it's also a good idea to just stop by the lab one hour before your scheduled time to ensure that this gets turned on. Our staff get really busy with other clients and don't always have time to turn this on with enough time before your scheduled event starts. The on button is in the top right corner of the machine. It's just a little flip switch, just right here. Once that's turned on, within about a minute or two, you'll hear all of the electronics start to warm up. You'll hear the monochromator go through sort of a startup procedure. And you'll also notice that that green mesh thing up in the top left starts to get warm as those lamps warm up. The reason this needs one hour to warm up is because the lamps, uh, just like old light bulbs in, a, in an old house, uh, will get brighter over time as they get hotter. So you want to make sure that you have a consistent light source before you start running any samples. If that's not something that matters to you, you're welcome to turn it on, wait the five minutes for it to do its sort of startup procedure and start. Just know that you're not going to have full light power and you're also not going to have consistent light power over uh, a long period of time. At the computer, there are two softwares that we are going to use. The first one is Perkin Elmer UV Winlab with a single circle with lots of light uh, kind of stripes through it. 
The other one is the UV WinLab Data Processor and Viewer. Data Processor and Viewer is also shortened as DPV. We'll see that in a minute. And that is separated colors, uh, three different separated colors here. So we're going to start with the Perkin Elmer UV WinLab. Log in as analyst. And it will bring you to this page right here. It will automatically be connected to the instrument unless the instrument is turned off, in which case you will get some errors here. If the instrument is turned off, you want to make sure that the software is completely closed down. You turn on the instrument, wait at least five minutes, and then you can turn the software back on. Uh, the instrument and the software do work together uh, very closely, so having the instrument off will cause issues in the software here. Just to uh, orient you in the software here, uh, on the left side are a bunch of base methods. A uh, method is parameters that you use uh, with the UV Viz. Next over is the folder list. You can see methods is listed here at the top. Um, that is just another way of looking at these base methods here. There's also tasks. A task is a method, so it's parameters, with data associated. So once you have run a scan uh, and you have data collected, you can save that to the tasks view. You can give it a name and that will help you come back to it later if you are only partially finished with the sample set that you want to put into that task. And then there's also instruments. We've only got one instrument attached. That's our Lambda 950. That is the model name of our instrument. And then the rest of these we don't really work with too much, um, but this software does have a built-in uh, ability to create reports. Um, if your company is very specific about the way they want to look at things, you can see there's, uh, for example, an ASTM standard report that you can export. There are a couple of other ASTMs and kind of uh, standard looking reports that you can export from your results here. Since most of our clients are researchers, we don't tend to use these very frequently, but you are welcome to uh, you know, play around with these report templates as well. However, we're going to start in methods here, and we're going to just choose a base method. An explanation of the base methods that exist here. The first one is scan, and these are organized in sort of the most frequently used, um, let's see. Now they are organized in the most frequently used um, options here. The first one is scan. That's going to give you an x-axis relating to the wavelength and a y-axis relating to the intensity of the light, whether that be percent transmittance, percent reflectance, or absorbance. This is the most traditional method when people think of spectrophotometry. The next one is time drive. That is going to give you an x-axis of time and a y-axis of light intensity, uh, transmission, absorption, or reflection. Um, with time drive, you choose only one wavelength and you monitor that one wavelength over the course of time. The most common uh, use for time drive would either to be to see things settling out of solution. If you expect to change, you know, maybe your uh, a silt settling down to the bottom of the crucible and therefore out of the light beam. It's also used when you, if you were to have uh, a chemical reaction that is happening over the course of time, this could show that. Obviously, if you have a chemical reaction, you want to make sure that you're choosing a cuvette that is not going to cause issues with that or melt or anything else like that. But that's time drive. And then wavelength program right here. Wavelength program is similar to scan, but instead of giving a graph, it gives a table. So you would tell it what wavelengths you are interested in. For example, 380 nanometers and 1012 nanometers. And it would return the intensity at those two wavelengths in a value rather than in a graphical format. Wavelength program is the best way to get quick data, especially if you are trying to identify concentration of a solution or um, trying to look at changes over time when you don't want to do time drive. Maybe they're 
changes over weeks rather than changes over several minutes or hours. Um, what you can do is just choose a couple of wavelengths that are interesting to you and identify the intensity of light at those particular wavelengths. Scan is by far the most commonly used. Um, you're welcome to use any of the other ones as well as your project may need. These ones down here that say quant, wavelength and scanning quant, they are very similar to the actual scan and wavelength program uh, base methods that we have up here. The ones with quant, however, have the option to allow you to identify what samples are standards and what samples are samples and will help do some of the math for you if you're trying to identify, uh, say, the concentration of an unknown material in a solution. So these can be helpful if you want it to do the math for you. And then this last one is a polarization scan. This does require an extra attachment, uh, a little polarizer lens. This is not always attached, so if you do want this, talk to staff. Uh, but this polarization scan would allow you to scan uh, over the 360 degree range in the round to see where polarizing light might happen. So we're going to choose scan because that is the most commonly used method. However, all of the principles that I'm going to show you will apply to all of these other ones. You'll just be given slightly different options through the course of setting up your method. So we're gonna start with scan. As long as the instrument has been on for a minimum of five minutes, you'll be able to open this bit of software. Uh, you'll remember that I said the instrument does need to warm up for a full hour in order to get reliable results. But in order for the software to work, you really just need that five minutes. This bar right here up in the top left corner is going to show you the state of the instrument. So right now it's initializing. Um, often you'll see idle while you are setting up the program like we see here. Um, every 28 days it will double check the instrument calibration status. Um, and sometimes you'll get a pop-up that says that it's been more than 28 days since the instrument was calibrated and it will ask you to calibrate. If you have the 2D detector attached and the machine has been on for one full hour, you are welcome to hit start um, while you're setting up your program to let that calibrate. The calibration takes between 5 and 10 minutes. If you do not want to do that, just notify staff that it asked you for a calibration and we will follow up with that. Uh, you do not have to use your paid time in order to calibrate this if you don't have the time to spare for it. So we're gonna just go through, it's called the folder list. This is just a tree of information. And we're basically gonna start at the top and go down to the bottom. So you can see it has labeled this already as a task. Um, this task is a method, a scan method specifically, and we're going to attach some data to it. And that's going to turn it into a task. We can put a description of our task here, especially if you anticipate that you will not get through all of the scans you want to do today or you anticipate continuing your scans in the future on this particular method putting in a description here will be very helpful whether that be a project name or the range of wavelengths that you're using this description will help you find your task later next is data collection uh, this is a quite a bit on this, the screen here but what you're seeing here in this section is a schematic of the interior of the instrument, which I kind of went over at the beginning. We've got our deuterium and our tungsten lamps. Uh, they come through several optics. We've got our monochrometer right here, if we follow the arrows through. The monochrometer is that prism that separates out the individual wavelengths. It goes through a few more optics, comes down here through a beam splitter. It selects one beam to be the reference beam, that's this red line and then one beam to be our sample beam, that's this blue line. Here is our sample department, compartment right here, and then our detector. Most of our detectors have two detectors on the interior, a lead sulfide and a PMT detector. These two um, detectors together are able to cover pretty much the entire range of light that our lamps put out. Um, which ranges from very low energy to fairly high energy 
depending on you know the wavelength the only thing in this schematic that you really need to pay attention to is where the lamp change occurs where the monochromator change occurs and where the detector change occurs assuming that you know your sample fairly well you should know where approximately you expect to see changes or features that are important to your research at the lamp change, the monochromator change, and the detector change, we see a slight bit of noise as we transition from one to the other. So there's a little bit of noise as we transition from the, de the deuterium lamp to the tungsten lamp, meaning that about at 320, we are going to see a little bit of excess noise and sometimes even a little bit of a jump. If you are expecting to see something right around 320 that you're very interested in, I would recommend changing this value. If you hover your mouse over it, it'll give you more information on uh, the possible values that you can change for that lamp. Same goes for the monochromator, which changes at 860 approximately. If you are really interested in data right around 860, I recommend changing this up or down to kind of move that monochromator change and the noise associated out of your way. And the detector change also occurs around 860, and you can change that to make sure that you don't get noise in areas that are interesting to you. Also on this page are the method settings. So if you don't have anything to change on the schematic, go ahead and leave it alone. It's fine the way it's set up. Method settings, though, you're always going to need to check. You're going to choose your wavelength range from high to low. Um, you'll remember that I said our total uh, range is from 3300 down to about 200. Sometimes we can get a little lower than 200 nanometers uh, if the machine is very well warmed up, is very recently calibrated, and you're using the 2D detector with a really friendly sample. Um, so there are a lot of things that kind of play into whether we can get all the way down to 200 or lower nanometers. Um, but typically our range is 3300 to about 200. Um, you want to put in just whatever range that you're interested in. Um, I'm going to go just a little above visible light at 1000 nanometers. And I'm going to go down into the UV range to 200 nanometers for my particular sample this time. And you choose those honestly just based on what information you are interested in. A longer scan or a wider range is obviously going to take quite a bit longer. Here you choose your data interval. So I'm going to look at every, uh, every individual nanometer. So I'll look at 1,000 and 999, 998. You can change this up or down to see data intervals that are bigger or smaller. Larger data intervals are going to allow you to go a little faster. So if you have a very wide range, but you're just doing a survey scan where maybe you don't need very, very clean data over it, you could increase this up to five or maybe even 10 nanometers as your data interval, and it would take points at wider intervals, allowing you to complete your scan a little bit faster. This last section here is called ordinate mode. You can see we've got five different options in here. E1 and E2 are the raw intensity of the sample and the reference beams. So this red beam and this blue beam. That is the, uh, the, the rawest of data that we can get from our machine. The other these two percentages, percent T and percent R, are percent transmittance and percent reflectance, uh, usually from zero to 100. It does occasionally occur that we get values higher than 100 and lower than zero. Uh, typically that's because the machine was not zeroed out correctly um, or the calibrations are way overdue. It also can have to do with uh, your sample. If you go slightly above 100 and slightly below zero, um, those values typically just count to 100 and zero. Um, it, if we're having issues with the calibration or with the zeroing out of the machine, uh, that typically will give you values of like 200 or more percent, or you'll get negative values even, um, like significantly negative values. Um, if you get either of those, I would recommend just trying to redo the corrections, replace your sample, and try again. Then this last one is absorbance. Oh, and one other note, sorry, on percent transmission and reflection. 
if your sample is set up to collect percent transmission, so you have light source sample detector, and you tell it to collect percent reflectance, it's going to tell you that what it's seeing is percent reflectance. The detector has no idea whether your sample's on one side or on the other. And so it's going to tell you whatever you want to hear. Please make sure that you select the correct value for how your sample is set up. If it is source sample detector, it should be transmission. If it is source detector sample, then it should be reflection. And that is up to you, the operator, not the machine, to identify. The last one here is absorbance. And the tricky thing about absorbance is it makes quite a few assumptions. It assumes that you are accounting for all of the light in whatever test setup you have. So if you are set up to collect transmission and you tell it that I want to identify absorbance, it is going to make the assumption that there is absolutely zero reflectance in your sample. So that's one to be careful of. And this is in absorbance units. This is not a percentage value. Most commonly, I will recommend that people do either transmission or reflection in the percentage, depending on their sample setup, um, and then convert to absorbance on their own so that they understand what they are looking at truly. This right here, the cycles, you can run multiple cycles of your scan if you expect there to be differences. However, if you expect there to be differences over time, I would recommend doing a time drive rather than a scan as far as your method choice. Next, moving on to program. This is information about the interior of the machine. If this is something that you want to report, that is up to you. Um, but this is like slits that we're using, detectors that we're using, um, attenuators, etc. Accessory. The only reason you would need to go to the accessory page is if you are using the URA attachment. If you are using the URA attachment and you click the check mark next to it, you'll see we get an extra little bit underneath accessory called universal reflectance accessory. In this location here, you can set up the additional parameters for the universal uh, reflectance accessory. If you have any questions about how to set that up, you can go to the help menu up here at the top. You'll also notice if I have the universal reflectance accessory selected under accessory, if I go back to data collection, my detector setup has changed somewhat and the detector change has changed somewhat. Uh, so that's worthwhile to note that your detector change is going to happen in a different location for the URA by default. We do not have the URA in right now. I'm going to show you how to use, I'm currently using the integrating sphere. Um, but like I said, uh, the integrating sphere pretty much applies to everything else as well. Under corrections right here, you're going to determine what baseline corrections you are using. Uh, I typically recommend doing a 100% transmittance and a 0% transmittance. That's going to give us a high zero and a low zero, essentially. Uh, it's going to tell us how much light the lamps can put out, and it's also going to zero out any light contributions from the room. Now our attachments are pretty well blocked off from light from the room, um, but having this 0% transmittance is going to inform the machine this is what complete darkness looks like at this point in the day. Um, and that can help, both, doing both of these can help minimize the number of over 100% or under 0% results that you get. The 0% uses an internal attenuator to close off the beams meaning that you don't have to do anything between these. It will just run those automatically. There is also the option, and not many of our clients take it, but there is the option of reflection corrections. So if you are looking to make uh, very nice mirrors or you are trying to identify the reflection coefficients of, uh, say, a solar cell, typically you have something that you consider 100% reflective. The reason that we do that with reflection and not transmittance is because there are lots of different types of reflection. There's diffuse reflection and then direct reflection. Diffused reflection would be like looking at a white surface. We know that white reflects pretty much all of the light back to our eyes when we're looking at a white surface. However, a mirror, which shows us our reflection rather than a white surface, is also very reflective. 
Those are two different kinds of reflection and you typically want to correct for the type of reflection that you consider uh, the most accurate. So we've got a couple correction types and you can put in a reference um, if you've purchased, say, a silver mirror that you consider your 100% reflection or you have a very, very white, clean surface that you want to consider your 100%, you are welcome to do these reflection corrections. Next, we are going to go into sample info right here after corrections. This is where we're going to spend the bulk of our time. After you've done everything before that, the machine should be set up to run your scan correctly or your method correctly. Here under sample info, we have two, ta two tabs, sorry. Sample tab, where we're going to tell it the number of samples that we have, and you're going to give it a sample ID. So today I'm actually looking at a pair of sunglasses, so that is the name of my sample ID. You can also put in a description. If you have multiple samples, this sample ID does need to be unique. So if you're running the same scan multiple times, you would want to put a dash one, dash two on the name of your sample ID to keep it unique. The other tab is the graphs tab. This is where it's going to show us our results as we collect them. Uh, so typically what'll happen, and actually, you know what, I'll just show you. So once I have my sample table set up, and if you are working with standards and unknowns, or you want to put a little more information to these, there are options here. So you can choose that this is a control or a sample or a blank. Um, and then CBD is the common, de common beam depolarizer. Um, you can read more about that in the help manual, but that is just going to depolarize the light um, to make sure that you don't have any polarization unless you specifically request it. Um, so this is just a little more information you can put in on these. If you are in any of, and I'm gonna sh close this for just a second, if you are in any of these quant programs right here, selecting whether something is a standard or a, an unknown or a blank is going to make a pretty big difference in these polarization scans. And if you are using the universal reflectance accessory, you will have more options on this, partic on this uh, table than you would have otherwise. But once you've got your table all set up the way you want it to, we're gonna click Start. It's gonna bring me over to the graphs page. Oops, I accidentally had it set in percent reflectance mode and we, I absolutely do not have my sample set up that way. We're gonna do transmission. Okay, back to sample info. Gonna click Start and you can watch up in this top left corner what it's doing. So we're gonna start with setting up and you will hear the instrument. Um, that is the monochrometer rotating right there that you hear. It is rotating to start at the 1000 nanometers that I requested it to start at. And here you can see we're at 1000 nanometers. This is the percent transmittance that it thinks it's seeing right now. But what it's gonna do is it's gonna do an auto zero um, it's going to do that auto 100% and that auto 0% uh, just on its own. Once it has finished setting up, I will get a dialog box right in the middle of my screen. Um, anytime any dialog box pops up on your screen, please make sure to read it before clicking OK or moving on from the dialog box itself. Um, but the dialog box will say, to remove the sample so that it can run its 100% and 0% transmittance. If your sample is large enough to just fit into the UV Viz, you're welcome to just hit OK and go for it at that point. If you plan on inserting any slits in order to narrow down the beam uh, to fit your smaller sample better, those slits need to be in place before you run your corrections. So let's say I got to this point, I forgot that I wanted to put in slits. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click cancel instead of starting that 100%. And I'm going to go to this align mode right here. 
Align mode is going to put a beam of white light through my sample chamber, so I'll be able to track where exactly the light is hitting my sample. That will allow me to align any slits that I want to align properly. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what that align looks like, specifically in the integrating sphere. Um, but that way you know um, kind of what you're looking for on the light. So this is the inside of the integrating sphere right here. We are looking at it from the left, kind of inside the sphere here. And what I have done is I've put it into a line mode and I just want to show you where the light is. If you have any of the other attachments, the URA or the 2D detector, all you do is you go to where you would put the sample and you'll be able to see this beam of light wherever that may be on those attachments. So I'm just going to take a Kim wipe. I'm going to put it over the hole and you can see somewhat faintly because it's a little bit bright in here, but you can see that kind of square slash rectangle of light. You can see it does not cover the entirety of this hole that we have allowed for the sample space. If I were to put in some sort of a slit in order to pare down the amount of light to go through or to mount my sample a little bit more properly, this is a really poorly cut piece of material, but I would want to make sure that my hole, so you can see the light beam right there, I would want to make sure that the hole of my slit fits nicely into the middle of that beam of light. That's where we're going to get the brightest light and the most useful information. At this point, I would tape this into place to make sure that this does not move over the course of my test. All this is doing is just blocking the light that is not gonna go through my sample from going into the detector. So this is something that you would want to have installed, whether it be on this side or on the reflectance side, if you're using one on the reflectance side. You want to have this installed before you run the 100% and 0% corrections. Otherwise, your 100% is going to be more light than can actually let be let through, and you have a pretty high likelihood of getting a negative value in your transmission because you're cutting down the amount of light with this and also with your sample. So I have turned off a line mode and I've gone back to quick start once my slits are properly in place or those uh, little magnetic attenuators are in place and we've got my dialog box that says remove the samples and press OK to perform our corrections or our auto zero. So we're going to click OK and you will start to hear the instrument uh, click through the wavelengths and you can hear the monochromator changing as these wavelengths change. Now, this is a slightly older machine. It's not one of the oldest in the lab by far. Um, it is considered a little bit of a newer machine, but um, the, connect the connector, so the cord between the UV Viz and the computer is not the fastest cord that is available to today's technology. Um, you can see this is counting down very, very slowly, and if we were to wait for this to get all the way down to the 200 that I requested, it's going to take forever. This is actually working at about a quarter of the speed that it normally does. It is doing currently about one nanometer per second. If that is the case, you're going to want to stop it, shut down all of the software, shut down the machine, and then start the machine back up. That typically just means that something in the communication between the machine and the computer um, has, uh, has slowed down. There's just a slowdown in the process. Um, by turning it all off and turning it all back on, you will hear a much faster uh, rate of speed, typically about four nanometers per second rather than the one nanometer per second that we were achieving just a minute ago. So I'm gonna restart the whole system and I'll show you the faster and the more normal speed that this should be going. All right, so I've restarted all of the software here and clicking OK to that dialog box that is recommending that I do my auto zero. Now if you listen, we're going quite a bit faster. This is about four clicks per second rather than the one from before. You'll also notice that um, I changed my parameters just a little bit. I told it to, check, to collect 
uh, in steps of five nanometers rather than one for the sake of not having this video be eons long. I figured it was better to have that be a little faster. So that pause at 860 right there, that was um, the detector change that we just heard. It was also the monochromator change, which occurs at about 860. Um, when we get down to about 320, we will see a similar, or we'll see a similar pause where it changes from one lamp to the other. And if you listen really closely, you can hear a little, um, almost like a growling sound as it transitions from one lamp to the other lamp. It will pause partway through as it's collecting data. Um, sometimes it needs a little bit longer at a certain wavelength in order to collect the correct amount uh, or intensity of light. Um, and it has some servos inside of it that sort of identify how much light it's collecting at any given time. And it will kind of self-assess as it goes to make sure that it's getting enough energy into the detector for an accurate reading. So you'll see we just passed 320 there. Um, it did pause. There was a very tiny little growling sound as we switched from one uh, lamp to the other. Um, but it was very, very faint. So now we've hit 200 nanometers. That's the lowest that I wanted to go with this particular sample. Remembering that we're collecting a correction right now. Um, that was the 100% transmittance. So that was all of the light um, that the lamps are putting out, it put into the detector. Now it's going to close an internal attenuator, meaning it's going to completely close off the beam, and it's going to run a 0% transmittance for us. You can see my transmittance is down very, very low, um, and there should be essentially no light getting into the detector. At this point, any light getting into the detector would be the cause of the room rather than the cause of uh, the lamps actually in the detector. And so it's going to zero out any light in the room. And there are some people who have the habit when doing spectrophotometry to turn off the lights in whatever room they're in. If you are the only person in the room, you are welcome to turn off the lights. However, please remember we have other clients and you can't just turn off the lights uh, for your UVVIS scans. If you're worried about introdu introducing errors from the light or in the room, uh, I would recommend doing a 0% correction and that's going to essentially do the same thing as turning off the lights otherwise. So once this gets back all the way down to 200 nanometers, we're going to get another dialog box. This dialog box is going to, this time, prompt us to put in our sample. And I believe when I restarted the software, I forgot to name the sample sunglasses like I had it named previously. So it's going to prompt me to put sample 113 into the machine rather than uh, an actual name of a sample. But had I put in a name of a sample, it would prompt me to put that in. Um, sample loading is going to depend on the accessory or the detector that you are using. For the 2D detector, like I mentioned, that is typically used for liquids, you will fill up your cuvettes and put them in the middle sample compartment. If you have a solid, you're going to put it, uh, if you have, sorry, if you have the integrating sphere, you're going to mount your sample in either transmission or reflection locations. If you have the universal reflectance accessory, you're going to place your sample face down on that little hole uh, to cover up uh, where the light comes through there. So it depends on your sample's morphology as well as the detector that you are using. Um, there's plenty of information about each of the detectors in the manual for the UV Viz, which you can find. Um, and, uh, you know, just think about it logically, what kind of information you're trying to collect, where the light is and where the detector is. By comparing all of those bits of information, you should be able to find a way to mount nearly any sample properly into the machine. So like I mentioned, the integrating sphere is kind of the most complex of our detectors. So I'm gonna show you how to mount a transmission sample in our uh, integrating sphere. So we've got our light beam is passing through here and we are going to be looking at these sunglasses right here. They um, actually are polarized, so a polarizing scan would be interesting on these, um, but we're just gonna do a regular transmission sample scan. We have two clips right here 
up against the sphere itself that can mount larger samples. So for this particular sample, we've got plenty of space to pretty much just stick it on there, just like that. Um, one thing you do want to be careful of, and you can see it happened a little bit, is making sure that these two clips don't accidentally go in uh, to block the light. Otherwise, these are going to be counted in some of the absorbance of your sample, um, where they are not in reality part of your sample. So I'm gonna see if I can figure out how to get these in there without um, getting those clips to fall inward. I think I'm gonna hold them out a little bit like that. These clips are on little Allen, Allen screws right here, so you can loosen and tighten them if you have a thicker or a thinner sample. But really the goal here is just to make sure that the light is going to pass nicely through my sample. I am going to be careful of my long pieces here because the light bounces through here, off of this mirror, off of another mirror back toward the back here, and then through here. And I don't want these to be in the way of any of that beam path. Same for my reference beam here. It comes in, bounces off of this, bounces off of a mirror back here, and then goes back this way. So I just want to make sure that these two kind of ear holder pieces stay way out of the way. Um, if this was a sample that I could uh, kind of do destructive testing on, I'd probably pop one of the lenses out before mounting it. But a lot of people don't want to tear apart their samples or um, are unable to tear apart their materials. So you get a little creative while you're mounting. Feel free to use tape, magnets, these clips, um, and any other stand that you can really come up with. There are a couple of little holes down in the bottom of the machine here, and we have had users 3D print their own sample holders after taking several very precise measurements to make sure that um, they can mount their sample properly in there. If you only have one sample or one or two samples, you know maybe it's a better idea to just sort of rig up something with tape. Um, but if you have a long project or several samples of similar dimensions that you're going to be testing, it might be worthwhile to create your own sample holder. So we're going to go back to the computer here where we've got this dialog box and we're just going to click OK to begin collection of that. So once your test is finished, you will be able to see on the graphs tab the results of your test. You'll get a little dialog box that says all the samples have been run, or if you're running multiples, if you had multiples in your sample table, it will ask you to mount the next one in sequential order on that table until you reach the end, in which case it'll say all samples have been run. So this went through from 1000 down to 200 nanometers, that's our x-axis because we are in scan mode, and you can see we started, uh, it lets most of this light through here, that's up above uh, 800, so approximately here-ish. So all of this light up here, this is going to be your near infrared. Looks like my sunglasses do a pretty good job of letting most of that through. Um, once we reach color, it's kind of interesting, we see a dip right around 688, um, which is kind of the red to orange shift right in here. So it looks like it lets through a little bit more red light and then a little bit less of kind of the orange yellow light here. Then you can see it stays pretty sturdy right here. This is at about 500. 500 is green approximately. So it actually lets through a little bit more green and a little bit more red um, than it lets through of sort of this orange yellow region. That's interesting to me and I don't know why they're like that, but that's how they are. And then they kind of drop off and you can see about right here is where we hit the end of the spectrum and we start hitting UV. What's interesting is at the UV region, you can see at my percent transmittance along the y-axis here, we hit zero. So these are UV protective uh, sunglasses. Keep your eyes from getting sunburned here. As pretty much as soon as we hit UV, we hit zero. Um, so I would say these are pretty successful sunglasses as far as they go. And then what's interesting here is we actually dip a little bit below zero once we get to about, where are we, 250. So this is where I was saying um, the integrating sphere and the universal reflectance accessory 
don't always have the capability to reliably go down as far into the UV region as one might hope. So this section here where it drops down below zero, we could either say that that is truly because our sunglasses are absorbing more, um, negative 10% more, um, or we could say this might be a feature of the detector that we are using. If I absolutely need this information, we could swap out to the 2D detector. It would be a little bit more tricky to mount a solid sample into the sample holder or the sample compartment for the 2D detector, but it has the ability to reliably go down this far. Or I could try to redo my corrections and run this again. If I get the same uh, kind of look or the same profile to this graph, then I would know to trust it rather than calling this some sort of uh, anomaly based on my detector. Um, but I mean, these are pretty, pretty good looking sunglasses. We let through reds, we let through greens, we let through a little bit of kind of orange yellow here. Um, so it's not going to distort your color too much, but it is going to protect your eyes from UV. So that's something to pay attention to, you know, whether the graph makes sense. Since each detector is going to give information slightly differently, it's also helpful to know what x-axis and y-axis you are working on. Um, if your graph makes no sense or you go way outside of the realm of realism, it's a good idea to try again. Just see what happens, see if that was an anomaly, see if, you know, a piece of dust floated through at exactly the wrong time. Um, because things like that happen with spectrophotometry. Um, it also helps to make sure that you know what you're seeing. Um, a lot of times if we are dealing with color, uh, people will get confused between what is transmitted and what is absorbed. So make sure that you know what y-axis you're using and make sure that you know how to interpret that information. All of the samples in my sample table have been run and I'm happy with all of the results and I'm ready to export. There are two ways to export. There's the way that we traditionally do it and then there's the way that I'm a little less familiar with but you are welcome to play around with. Export can be done within this software. If you go to processing you have the ability to add equations to your uh, results. Under results you'll see what those equations do for your sample. And then under output, you can output templates. Uh, typically that's going to give you a PDF of that template. But as I mentioned earlier, we've got ASTM standard templates that you can export. I don't typically work with these. Most people prefer just to take their raw data from the sample information here and just take home an Excel file, which for them, this processing step is a little bit just more involved than what they're looking for. You are welcome to do the processing in-house if you would like. Make sure that you have ample machine time to do that with the software. If you would just like to take home the uh, raw XY axis data, then you're gonna come up here and click send to DPV. That's gonna open that second software that I showed you at the very beginning, the data processor and viewer, DPV. If you've run multiple samples, it's going to overlay them all here, which I find to be rather useful to compare all of the samples from that particular task that you have run. On the left side, we will have a tree, so sample view one, and it will have all of the samples that you ran from that sample table all underneath there. You can click through each one individually to see each one individually, or click on sample view one, and that will give you the overlay of all of them. I apologize that I only have one, so you can't see that uh, in person. There is the ability to do a little bit of math in here. You can find the difference between curves, you can compare them. Um, there is a little bit of processing that you can do <clears throat> where you can smooth or find the derivatives or do arithmetic to these um, scans. So you're welcome to do a little bit of processing here. Um, like I said, most of our clients are just looking for the X, Y values, at which point you go to File, Export. You'll see your list of sample names and their destination to be the default directory. 
The default directory is specified down here. You can see by default, it's going to export to sort of a weird location on the local computer. This computer is connected to our lab network. So I'm gonna click these three dots here. On any of our computers that are connected to the internet, you can go to this PC, and underneath this PC, you will find a uh, drive that's called MCL. It usually will have a long address after it also. This MCL drive is, like I said, available to any computer that is on the internet. So uh, most of our computers, there's a token two or three that are not connected. Um, and it has a folder for each machine that we have in the lab or have had in the lab. There are even some old machines on here. This is the UV Viz right here. Under that, we've got user data and you can create a new folder under this and create and save your data there. Um, the nice thing about saving to the network, first of all, is if your lab mate comes in and is looking for data, it's really easy for us as lab staff to help direct them to the right location because it's been saved to the same location as everyone who uses the UVVis saves it. Also, if there is ever a lab shutdown or for some reason you can't get into the lab, um, our staff have access to this from anywhere and we can send your data to you rather than we, us having to get into the lab or you having to come physically to the lab to get the data. Um, so under user data, you can create your folder. Um, because this browsing method here is within the data processor and viewer, sometimes clicking create a new folder is just a little bit too much for it and it'll crash. If that's the case, just create a new folder by going to the desktop, clicking on the user data, and then you just have the regular file explorer open right here, and you can create your folders, your folder inside of here. But I'm gonna scroll down to me right here, and I'm going to just save it within my main folder here. You can save it as a CSV, a JCAMP, or an ASCII text. Um, CSV is most common since that can easily be read by MATLAB, Excel, etc. And because this is set as the default directory, it will automatically save all of your samples to that same location. You can actually specify that each one be saved to an individual location if you'd prefer. Um, I have yet to meet someone who would prefer that, but it's an option then click export. Now if I go to the file explorer, this PC, our network, I go to the UV viz, I go to user data, and you'll notice there is a folder on the network called manuals. If you want to click through those for a little more information on any of the softwares, you're welcome to. So under user data, we're going to go to my name. Here is the sample that we just used, a CSV file and this will open in Notepad or Excel depending on how your computer's defaults are set up. But I've got my x-axis and my y-axis on all of this and I can plot this on my own or do whatever math to it that I would like to accomplish. This... Oh, did you stop? No. No. <laughs> this is a CSV file. Um, if you want to save this as a Perkin Elmer original file, then you just go to File, Save As. That's going to save it as a .sample or a .smp. Um, that is going to be only readable within the data processor and viewer, but that can be helpful to have the original file to come back to rather than just the CSV if you realize that it was exported improperly. When I go to close this software, it actually will give me the option or remind me to save the data. So I want to save the unsaved data sets. It'll ask me where I want to save. Again, I'm going to tell it this PC. Underneath this PC, I'm going to go to the network, UV viz, user data. I'm going to find my name and click OK and then it'll close out the software for me. Now if I go back to my folder, I've got a SP file in addition to this CSV file. This SP file, I can come back and open the original file format if something were to happen to my exported file format. 
back to the original software here. Um, all we need to do is close this out. It will ask if you want to save the task before closing the program. The modifications that have been made to this task is the collection of this data right here. So I'm going to say yes, uh, especially if you want to come back and keep working within this task. Um, you would want to save it and you know give it a proper description. If I go now, you remember this was our original screen in the software. If I go to the tasks, um, I will be able to see today's with the description of sunglasses. So that was the task that I just ran. By double clicking that, it will reopen the task. I'll be able to look at the data. And so here's my data, it's back again. And I'll also be able to add extra samples here if I so desire. So I can keep running things um, on top of the scan that I just ran to compare them to one another a little bit more easily. You also, if you don't want to go through that direction, you can create a new, um, a new task and just overlay the data yourself in whatever analysis software you'd like. Make sure to close all of the software when you're done. Take your sample out of the machine and turn off the machine. Um, there is no need for you to remove the detector. Uh, again, please do not remove the detector. That is the staff's job. And you are good to go. As a reminder, push your chairs back under the desk, throw away all used Kim wipes and gloves, and take your samples with you as you leave. Please also remember to not use any personal USB sticks in the lab computers. To save your results, if the computer is connected to the internet, open Google Chrome, go to gmail.com, and email the results to yourself using the lab account. If the lab account is logged out, please ask staff to log you in. If no staff are present, a personal account may be used. Please do not log out of the lab account. If the computer is not connected to the internet, find an MCL-owned USB, usually a metallic blue color. Copy your data from the computer onto the USB, then use any internet-connected computer in the lab to email the data to yourself. Please do not put the MCL USBs into your personal computer. Once you have completed this training video, email lab staff at characterization.uofu at gmail.com to schedule a one-hour follow-up training session called an observation. Bring your sample to the MCL at the scheduled time, and staff will watch and assist as needed for the first hour of your machine use. After you have successfully completed the observation hour, you are authorized to schedule time on this machine in the MCL for independent use.